Um, I mean, I could, I, could, I could sum up every New York trip um, with bow with three words, um, which, which are donuts, poetry, and chicken. That, that would be my three-word bio. But, you know, for those of you who don't know bow, you should know bow in, in this kind of way, too. So, bow fee. Balfi's latest book, Thousand Star Hotel, which is being sold in the back, Coffee House Press 2017, chronicles the poet's personal history as a Vietnamese refugee and a father and the silence around racism, police brutality, and the invisibility of the Asian American poor. Viet Thanh Nguyen writes that the book combines Bao's trademark blend of passion, politics, and poetry. Bao has been a performance poet since 1991. He is a two-time Minnesota Grand Slam poetry champ and a National Poetry Slam finalist who has been on HBO's Russell Simmons Death Pre uh, Presents Death Poetry uh, a couple times, at least. His, his first collection of poems, Song I Sing, was published by Coffee House Press in 2011, and he recently released his first children's book, A Different Pond, which is doing very well, um, illustrated by Vietnamese illustrator and graphic novelist T. Bui. Please give it up workshop for Bao Fi. Thank you, Tayo. Um, thank you, Tayo. I could, I could spend all of my time up here reminiscing and talking about how great people in this room are, uh, but we have a time limit, so I'm gonna speed through it. Um, thank you, Tayo. Thank you, Asian American Writers Workshop for this. Um, thank you, Coffee House Press. Thank you to my friends old and new who showed up today. Some of y'all I haven't seen in years. Um, uh, thank you to the Kickstarter campaign uh, that raised money to send a stank-ass poet around reading poetry books. Uh, I just, and, and my fellow poets, I'm a fan of these two, so I can't, I'm gonna go quick and then I'm just gonna sit down and shut the fuck up and listen to you too. So um, I'm just gonna get into the poetry and we're gonna blaze through, all right? So, um, Thank you all. Uh, this first poem is about something that happened when I was a teenager pushing carts at a supermarket. Um, and uh, I apologize, there is a uh, certain vulgar language in it. Um, it. You can be mad at me for using it, but it goes somewhere. So just try to listen, I don't know. I'm not gonna tell you what to do, whatever. Uh, this is called vocabulary. Maintenance, they called it. Minimum wage to guide shopping carts from parking lot to corral. We lined those silver metal buggies with red plastic flap seats for infants into rows of 10 to 12, up to 30 if you were a team of two. Keep at the push long enough those stacked trains would roll. The hardest part was steering. One winter, a fellow cart pusher confided in me during a lull as we stood near the weak warmth of the rattling heat vent in the cart corral. Like me, he was a non-white boy from a poor family. Like me, his face was limestone and granite pressed tight together. His eyes distant, he spoke of how much he missed his girlfriend, how they had been reunited the night before. Yesterday night, he told me, we got back together and I fucked the shit out of her. I missed her so much. He said it like their love saturated every atom of his being and shook him. As if all his veins were laid bare to weep at the memory of her. As if his ache for her was a chasm he could never hope to cross, only tumble into headlong. Timid virgin that I was, my eyes wide open as if he had just tried to convince me of a God I didn't think could exist. I just nodded <laughs> sympathetically. <laughs> Sobbing, he wiped his eyes, stormed away from me into the slush, ashamed of laying his emotions so bare and never talked to me about her again. Now, over 20 years later, I make my living with words. But all I can say about the bombs that sought my family is they missed us. I still can't reach out to my friends, especially my fellow straight boys, 
their eyes the size of stop signs. I find myself wanting to tell my mother and father I love them, and I just can't. I think about that boy in that cold car corral, how he found the only words he could, or perhaps more importantly, the vocabulary to overcome himself. And I wonder if I'll ever find a language to speak of the things that haunt me the most. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, this next poem is called Knock Off. And uh, it's, the idea behind it is the scholar, Dr. Juliana Hupigiz, um once taught me this idea, this observation that Asians in America are always interrogated. Um, we're always inauthentic, no matter what, whether it's activism or want to be white or whatever, the, or being an American, whatever the fuck you want to call it, uh, we're always fake. So this is called knockoff. <clears throat> Fake Gucci, fake Prada, fake Burberry in a fake store in a fake part of town shielded by a fake dragon facade. Fake weave made with real black licorice hair. Fake housing projects, fake mansion in Bel Air. Fake fingernails and real toxins in real lungs. Fake eyelids make flutters in fake mirror paid for by real dollars. Fake high wire kung fu, fake hero, fake man. Fake tech boom, fake Silicon Valley. Fake red blush flush with success. Fake inflation, fake gentrification. Fake love making, fuck your little dick, your wrong slant pussy. Fake sex fucking fake soldier. See if you can fake this hazing, fake struggle, real bullets, real deportation, fake strength. Oh, are you complaining with your fake weakness? Shut the fuck up, fake activist, fake minority, fake white person, fake person of color, fake feminist, fake queer, fake working class, fake poor, fake oppression, fake your thank yous. You should be glad you're even here with your fake gratitude, fake longitude, fake latitude, fake ass poet, unless you're a real white poet with a fake Chinese name that belongs to a real person, in which case let us taste your funk, but otherwise fuck your fake fusion, you fake chink. No wait, you're a gook, you fake slope. No, you fake dot head, you fake rag head. No, you fake flag on the front door, threadbare. You fake and taking up space, but can't see how much through your slanted eyes. You fake Nike swoosh flailing in a factory, fake iPhone 678 suicide, you fake NBA player, overrated chink in a jock strap, fake boat but real leak, fake pirate but real rape, fake passport but real pat down, fake concentration camp but real internment, fake railroad but real bang, fake English speaker on the other end of a, end of a tech line, fake scientists selling secrets to Japan, no way China, no way Korea, fake ID, fake English, fake country, fake fault line, fake demarcation, fake citizen, fake American, fake eyes, fake face, fake arms, fake legs, fake voice, fake your every little part. Um, just real quick, uh, uh, something happened. I was uh, late driving my daughter to daycare and uh, this stuff happened and um, it's called rolling through a four-way. <clears throat> 9.35 a.m. on a bright day on the way to daycare, one cop is positioned behind the wheel, back on the side where your toddler, dark hair, yellow skin like a burst of reverse sunflower sits strapped in her booster seat, a hand on his gun, elbow cocked, a scarecrow angle. Do I make myself as small a target as possible as my people have learned to do in this country? Will it save me? Will my daughter see me handcuffed or shot when I reach for the insurance information? Will I blame the closest person to me? Will I blame myself? Who will blame me? Who will say I have no right to say anything? On the other side of the horizon of glass, the police officer asks you to roll your window down his claw on the butt of his gun standing as if shielding the whiteness of his hand against the matte black gun but you can see it the other cop's gun in the mirror too both closer than they appear um, so this is a four part poem about all types of like uh, like fucked up love and attractiveness and heartbreak uh, I'm just going to read the first part <laughs> we can't deal with this much heartbreak at once. <laughs> so I broke it into pieces. So, um, part one, document. <clears throat> Let's say the smart white girl from the wealthy family 
that you always thought was so pretty ends up being a part of your study group. As she comes to your house with the others to work on the final project, she wrinkles her nose and asks if there are roaches. And instead of hating her, you hate your mom and dad. She'll never love you, but that's preferable to their love, which you've grown to need a translator for. They taught you you were ugly long before this white girl caught your eye. They are nowhere near to hear her English. They're off at one of their two or three jobs. You've learned about the Black Panthers in a gym, gym room closet. You've learned about the American Indian movement patrols in your neighborhood, but you don't know how it all connects to crushes balanced atop nests of roaches. Don't know what to do with these feelings, but tuck it all away and hope it doesn't crawl out like it will. At sudden moments for the rest of your life, can't seem to figure out what all this has to do with your war-turn family and this beautiful woman who hates the house you're raised in, its scuttling denizens, whether or not they're real, she imagines you infesting this place. Um, I just have two poems left. Um, so I, uh, I feel like I should never admit this because uh, it gives my enemies an ammunition. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, I'm really terrified of bugs. <laughs> and, uh, and so there are these, these bugs called like house centipedes. Uh, yeah. Uh, and I was living in this place that was full of them and I did research to get over my fear. Um, and then, <laughs> uh, that's like reading ghost stories. Like you just can't help it. You're like, fuck, I gotta, you know. Um, but then I was, uh, you know, after my partner and I broke up and I was like living in my own place, uh, there was a house centipede uh, in the tub and I wrote this poem about it. And, and um, it, it, a lot of people mistakenly call them silverfish, but silverfish are a different insect. It's okay. <laughs> Just so you all know, I know this is like fucking important as fuck, okay? <clears throat> Not a silverfish. A large centipede was in my tub for days. It looked like a prehistoric zipper made of needles. A firecracker with too many fuses. I skipped taking a shower for way too long. <laughs> An unspoken compromise, hoping it would disappear on its own preferring to be dirty over drowning my fear. Eventually, I trapped it under a container and then took it outside while it scrambled like an explosion of exclamation points in the foggy plastic, and I let it go. These centipedes are often mistaken for silverfish. They actually make dinner of them and other more damaging pests. I know what it's like to be mistaken for something else. To feel that the first reaction when a new set of eyes encounters your body is to want to smash you. To wonder what in history made a caterpillar a caterpillar, a ladybug a ladybug. To know what it's like to be invisible until revealed to be ugly, alien thing, hairy wiggle whose body tells the only story anyone is willing to hear. What it shook free of my trap, its head made of stepladders, its body a spasm of a hundred loose threads of fate. It didn't make a sound, but I swear I could hear it scream that it wanted to travel back in time to prehistory, rewrite the many veins of possibility that would shape how it would be seen so that the present could be a place where it could be understood for what it was. Um, again, thank you all coming, for coming out. Thanks for the organizers. Uh, thanks for climbing the steps. Um, this is my last poem. I'm excited to hear you too. Thank you. I'm honored to be in this space with you. I'm honored in this space with all of y'all who are coming out on a Friday night uh, for poetry. Thank you. So this is a poem called Refugee Requiem. Uh, very quickly, um, I wrote this um, around the time that my daughter uh, you know, the, me and her mother, we had this plan where 
uh, if our daughter hit us or was acting up, we'd be like, Daddy has to go take a time out from you until you can promise to stop hitting or you can calm down. It's like a reverse, like instead of timing out your kid, you time out yourself and stuff. Um, and, uh, and, and, my, and it's really intense. Um, my daughter has like, you know, she's an only child and she has intense abandonment issues. And so when we would be like, you know, I, we just have to leave, she would just like start crying and like uh, running after us a fucking like Vietnam refugee movie and shit like you know like um and it, it it triggered a bunch of stuff in me you know um I won't get into it but my the my family what we went through when I was a baby to escape Vietnam to come to this country is really intense in terms of like uh bombing in the airport for hours people getting killed um all around us um and so I wrote this uh thinking about all of this um and just really quickly, one reference that I make. Uh, when I went back to Vietnam, uh, when I was 21, I was taking a bus through the countryside, and I saw a jagged hole um, filled, it was like a jagged hole in the ground filled with water and rice growing out of it. And uh, I asked uh, one of the locals, like, what is that, you know? And he, and he told me it's a bomb crater. Uh, it's a bomb crater, and some uh, enterprising Vietnamese person was growing rice out of it. And I was like, that is the most Vietnamese shit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> refugee Requiem. Our daughter hits me. Fist tiny toe ball socking my forearm. Since we are trying to teach her about consequence, I tell her daddy needs to go sit somewhere else without her until she can apologize and promise to stop hitting. She is already crying. And she runs towards me, arms outstretched, and she wants me to hold her. My resolve gives me nowhere to go but to run away from her around the dining room table. And she chases me, blubbering tears, as if she were a war orphan in Vietnam and I her C5 galaxy. That's the way it is in this country, my mom will tell me in Vietnamese. If it were you, you'd be afraid of me spanking you. Here's the part where I make money and fame by telling you Vietnamese people are abusive and backwards and should be glad to be living in whatever puddle or efficiency or condo or project or suburb seem fit to contain our stink in the United States. Instead, I wonder if our daughter is not as far from the war as I hope she'd be. I wonder what ghosts made of gunpowder and spilled oil in jet stream, live in her tiny muscles. If oceans drown her veins so she could run at me like this to test the caliber of my resolve, the buoyancy of my memory, the times my body feels too small to do what I ask it to survive. Her heavy steps leaving bomb craters around the dining room table, jagged holes that will, through rain and time, and surviving hands become rice patties. I pick her up. I hold her. She puts her chin on my shoulder. And through teary eyes, she sees everything behind me. Thank you all. Give it up again for Bao, that was incredible. I didn't know you had a Kickstarter campaign to get here, that's awesome. We should have a Kickstarter campaign so you can move to New York. <laughs> There's lots of chicken, <laughs> lots of centipedes. Um, yeah, maybe that's not a selling point. Um, okay, so our next reader is Patrick Rosal. Um, Patrick's book, Low Key, just won a major poetry award. Uh, he received the 2017 Academy of American Poets Lenore Marshall Poetry Prize. Um, that means the most outstanding book of poetry of the year. So congratulations, Patrick. Um, one of the judges, Rigoberto Gonzalez, wrote that the book sings as both lament and celebration. It connects histories, landscapes, and stories of times past to the joyous rhythms of the present. 
Uh, the book is Patrick's fourth book. Um, he's currently on at work actually on a book of prose, which sounds really fascinating, and I can't wait for it to come out. It's about um, his mother's arrival during the civil rights era um, and linkages between Filipino immigration uh, and African American history. Um, also, in case Patrick didn't already sound extremely impressive, <laughs> In 2009, he was awarded a Fulbright Senior Research Fellowship to the Philippines. And then, again, in 2017, he was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship. Um, and he just came tonight from Philly, um, where he teaches, uh, or no, teaches at Rutgers University Camden. And he came out to read to us tonight. Thanks so much. I, too, don't want too long of a prelude, but I wanted to... I was telling a story in the back to Ken that the Bao and I met through the workshop because many years ago, maybe like 17 years ago, the workshop held something called this big conference called Intimacy and Geography. And me and Bao were on this. <laughs> we were on this panel. We didn't even have no books yet. <laughs> so wasn't nobody going to come anyway. But they also scheduled us with Lee Young Lee in the next room. <laughs> So Lee Young Lee had like this room and we had like three people in the next room. But we had more laughter, I remember that. That's for real. And I'm happy to meet Sokintari for the first time here at the workshop too. So a lot of good encounters happen, happen here. And I have one confession to make that, that might do some harm to my friendship with Bao. I'm actually a bigger fan of song than I am of Bao. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'm thinking of everybody in the Caribbean and Southeast Texas and um, now Mexico and, um, and in India and Nigeria. Typhoon poem. The teacher can't hear the children over all this monsoon racket, the zillion spoons whacking the rusty roofs, the wicked tin streams flipping full-grown bucks off their hooves. Everywhere there used to be a river, there's a bigger river now. Every Hard face on the block is sopping. Even the court where girls from St. Ignominious ran the roughneck boys off to play their own three-on-three -three in plaid skirts and church shoes for cash. Forget it. The whole city's flash flood with brawn enough to flush trucks sideways down the capital's widest drives. The crushed tonnage bobs around a bit at the foot of some Spanish bastard statue before it stalls and pools on white church steps. Brute pilgrims face it. Paddling dogs won't make it. So children got no shot. But quick thinking, this teacher lashes her students two at a time with wire and stray twine. She binds them across their breasts to trees and metal posts lining the streets, half-flooded walk. No goddamned way, she swears. She won't let one little one be washed out, even if their wriggling makes their armpits bleed. They'll have to make peace with the vision of their uncles and neighbors' blue bodies bumping past before they fishtail out of sight. You can't wish away the deluge. You can't vanish the bloated carnage waters. But the tykes in crew cuts and pigtails still fastened to shafts and trunks in ragged rows will survive. For now, their teacher has made them safe by building an orchard of them in the middle of a city road. This small chorus of young hard fruit this little grove 
moaning. There's this beautiful photo. Um, I think that it was after Typhoon Haiyan. Um, that was, um, it was in the New York Times. It's a beautiful photo of children and the, their schoolyard after the typhoon is completely flooded. And they're walking on chairs in order to cross the uh, flooded schoolyard. Children walk on chairs to cross a flooded schoolyard. Tai Tai, Rizal Province, Philippines, based on the photo by Noel Celis. Hardly anything holds the children up. Each poised mid-air, barely the ball of one small foot kissing the chair's wood so they don't just step across but pause above the water. I look at that cotton mangle of a sky post-typhoon and presume it's holding something back. In this country, it's the season of greedy gods and the several hundred cathedrals worth of water they spill onto little tropic villages like this one where a girl is likely to know the name of the man who built every chair in her school by hand, six of which are now arranged into a makeshift bridge so that she and her mates can cross their flooded schoolyard. Boys in royal blue shirts and red rain boots. The girls brown and bare-toed in starch white shirts and pleated skirts. They hover like bells that can choose to withhold their one clear, true bronze note until all this nonsense of wind and drizzle dies down. One boy even reaches forward into the dark, sudden pool below towards someone we can't see and at the same time, without looking, seems to offer the tips of his fingers back to the smaller girl behind him. I want the children ferried quickly across so they can get back to slapping one another on the neck and cheating each other at checkers. I said time and time again, I don't believe in mystery. And then I'm reminded what it's like to be in America, to kneel beside a six-year-old to slide my left hand beneath his back and my right under his knees and then carry him up a long flight of stairs to his bed. I can feel the fine bones, the little ridges of the spine with my palm, the tiny, smooth stone of the elbow. I remember I've lifted a sleeping body so slight, I thought the whole catastrophic world could fall away. I forget how disaster works, how it can turn a child back into glistening butterfish or finches. And then the kids just do what they do, which is teach the rest of us how to move with such natural gravity. Look at these two girls, center frame, who hold out their arms as if they're finally remembering they were made for other altitudes. I love them for the peculiar joy of returning to Earth not one ounce of impatience, this simple thrill of touching ground. So I am working on a book of prose, but I'm also working on a, uh, uh, a new and selected um, poems too. So I'm reading, uh, I'm writing these, these, longs are s these poems are so fucking long. <laughs> so uh, 
I'm gonna read this one, and if there's time, I might, I might do one other short poem, but we'll see. Hey, could I grab my water? Um, I, I run the graduate program down at Rutgers Camden, and um, every year we have this uh, publishing panel, and I'm like, I'm the poet, and I'm like, I don't know what the fuck I'm gonna do with these agents. And, <laughs> And with all due respect to my like colleagues in the publishing world, like without a doubt, every year one of these cats, I would use another word, but one of these cats <laughs> will say that boys don't read. And uh, well, that's bullshit. There's all kinds of reading. <clears throat> boys, bodies, and flight are also a kind of text. And there's an epigraph, boys don't read. <laughs> that was said by the experts. <laughs> These kids run their sloppy fly routes right to left in a crabgrass park. They are counting by the thousands. They read the defense and cheat the rush or jump the snap. One of them eats a nice blindside hit from a slightly older, bigger kid and buckles for half a second, then jumps to his feet. You might not notice the big kid brush the shorter one's shoulders before he shoves the littler guy, littler guy good and hard and hustles toward the huddle. When I was their age, there were days no one for nine blocks could come out to play. So I used to ride my bike to Grace Street and sit alone in the middle of the baseball field, standing up once in a while to pitch dirt bombs at the church's back wall. It's glass stained with the lean, long robed saints of Bonham Town and a few undecipherable aphorisms of the Roman faith. Among my first urges toward ruin, to crack open any enclosure, holy or not, and set free what might roost inside. I'd imagine slinging a rock through one of the saints' heads and a plague of grackles streaming from the breach, the birds rushing out a lot like gangs of brawling boys do, spilling across an avenue underneath a second floor neon Sichuan sign. How many times I was swift to headbutt another kid in the chin or mush some brat in the face who I thought was breathing too hard and too close at the bar. And so with a quick swat, I could set a whole downtown plaza ablaze with crews of crackling boys Pouncing upon each other under street lamps, I bet we'd look like jackdaws stomping out flames or rooks simply mauling smaller birds. Someone told me the key to peace is learning to make my mind still as a field. Like maybe the one from my childhood with its crumbling backstop across from the abandoned cosmetics warehouse. I've often wondered if the jagged painted glass of Gray Street Church is finally nailed shut with some cheap chipboard. I keep thinking the roof has probably collapsed by now, but I'm really remembering a shrine near my mom's hometown that was bombed by Americans who thought the enemy were hiding inside. When the townspeople came to see the damage, there was a real sky in the gaping space left in place of the original sky frescoed on the dome which had fallen in. More wondrous, the attack knocked loose a huge statue from its perch. The 10-foot saint cut from local stone landed on its feet and was poised at the center of the altar, and thus forever blessed the site with enough power to invoke a pilgrimage by the grown sons and daughters of the nation's latest dictator. They knelt before that hard white figure to request their several intercessions, sobbing, prostrate, and surrounded by men strapped with armor lights. By then, the local engineers and artists had been called to fix the image of heaven, the shadows of small black birds now fleeing paradise along the sun rays' golden angles of descent. I was brought up on the other side of the planet 
in a Jersey neighborhood whose one field was quiet long enough to bear the silence of a 75-year-old church and a solitary nine-year-old boy testing his scrawny arm and the inherited pleasures of rage. I was 25 when my mother died. It would be several years before she came back for a quick visit. We met in that field by our old house. A bare maple lay on its side between us. She somehow figured out I was hungry, so she turned to a line of bushes near the crown of the fallen timber and whistled. Three notes into my mother's call, out burst a half dozen fluttering game quail so quick to flight, they impaled themselves on the bare branches of the fallen tree. My mom held out her arms as if to call my attention to the flapping bloody fruit. There are no photos of my mother before 1958 the year she arrived in America. I think as a child, she must have been very much like the children in our ancestral village who once accompanied me to the family cemetery. Even there, these children dart from grave to grave, reciting their own names and the distant years carved by hand. They leap from one hard marker to another, laughing in brigades. They laugh like hundreds of flocks once locked up in some musty space made sacred by so many small bodies crashing into glass. Doesn't everyone know of boys who dream repeatedly of wings and yet so few of us know what to tell them the morning they wake up and feel what it's like to be changed by pain. Every generation, there's another kid on the wrong side of the world who stops praying in a dusty field to lift the stone so he can begin to understand what it's like to wish for the same thing for the rest of his life promising to spring every body of every ghost from every shackle and every old wood hold. It took me decades to salvage my sadness from books. Tell me again that boys don't read. It is their hothead fathers and stubborn uncles who are too terrified to listen, let alone inscribe the fleeting stories that would name the first secret agony of those little bones poking through their backs. That's it. Thank you very much. Thanks all. Give it up for Patrick again. That was so beautiful. It was just like so lush. I feel like that touched on so many things. Um, our next reader is Sokhantri Swai. Um, I'm really excited to announce that this is actually her first book of poetry yeah. ever. Yeah. yeah. When does it come out? Uh, the 28th. The 28th, yeah, it comes out September 28th. Wow. So get it now. Um, so the forthcoming book is called Aspara in New York. Um, Aspara. Aspara. Um, so Country was born in a refugee camp in Thailand shortly after her parents fled Cambodia after the fall of the Khmer Rouge regime. Um, they were sponsored to come to the United States and resettled in the Bronx where she grew up. She is a pushcart nominated Khmer writer and musician and the poetry editor for Newtown Literary, which if you haven't heard of it, it's uh, the journal for Queens, the only liter literary journal for the borough of Queens. Um, she's a founding member of the Cambodian American Literary Arts Association and an adjunct lecturer at CUNY in Harlem. Um, and like I said, she's a musician. She's also the recent recipient of the American Opera Projects Composer and Voice Fellowship for 2017 to 2019. So give it up for Sok. Thank you. Wow, I got 15 minutes, I'm totally gonna use it. <laughs> this is never gonna happen again. <laughs> um, sorry, I gotta be serious for a second. Uh, according to the Atlantic, between 1965 and 1973, the US dropped 2.7 million tons of explosives on the border of Cambodia and Vietnam to flush out uh, the communists. And that's more than the Allies dropped in the entirety of World War II. 
whose population was then smaller than New York City, killed between 150,000 to 500,000, and is the most heavily bombed nation in history. So I want you to think about that and, uh, and the people who came here as a result of that and how when you live with that kind of legacy, what does that do to you as a people, especially when you are, uh, are not established in this country? Okay, I have to be serious. Okay, um, let's see. I'm not gonna be as loud as you. The fields are rife with, with landmines. Legs and arms rain down like Nixon's bombs on the Cambodia-Vietnam border, bruising the ground with craters. This is how they raped the land. Our ancient enemy, the Vietnamese, extends soldiers and appendages across our border once more. In their exodus, gaunt Cambodians meet pirates who strip their dignity for gold as Thai refugee camps bed them beside dirty soldiers and first world promises. I recall the Phnom Penh of our teens bursting with succulent juice from pomelos ripped from their peels, spraying the boardwalk. Remember the monsoons when floods meant ponds for children, good crops meant families ate year round when life and living still mattered. Music plays from an unknown distance. Survivors gather to resume, to resume a dance unfinished, unfurling their fingers and gestures once described as lotus blossoming. Swai Chi, a.k.a. Nyet Peng, Ethnicity Khmer. DPOB, January 9th, 1951. Takao, occupation, soldier, farmer. Dependents, one. Long Nyim, female, 1956, wife. Occupation, housewife, farmer, two. Swai Su so Ti, male, June 14th, 1973, son, has very poor eyesight. Three. Swai Su so Kun Te Ri, female, J July 21st, 1980, daughter. List family, tree, and current status. Principal applicant, Swai Tui, 62 years old, father, dead. Nyet Kun, 57 years, mother, dead. Swai Son, 35 years, brother, dead, spouse. Long Sen, 48 years, father, missing. Sem Hiang, 48 years, mother, missing. Long Xiang, 20, 20 years, brother, missing. Long Sri, 17 years, brother, missing. Long Sok Han, 15 years, sister, missing. Long Sri Kia, 13 years, sister, missing. No others. She prays to her altar, says God, but means something else. Incense hangs in the room, ancestral spirits. Down the elevator, Spanish speakers pretend she can't understand Filipina. Khmer karaoke blares through a steel door. Down the hallway, neighbors mistake it for Chinese. Jehovah's Witnesses ring on weekends. She holds her breath until voices fade. Fearless German roaches dot the kitchen walls coated yellow from past deep fried dinners. A frozen bird defrosts under trickle of water, home from work, a plate of dismembered meat. An archive is sequined in puffy sleeves from previous decades in the closet. Windows keep out bugs, not midnight basketball games. She kisses her husband goodnight to separate beds in lonesome rooms where sons once slept. Why you come home late in the dark? You wear the stupid dress and stupid big boot, no job. Where the money you want me save? At least prostitute bring home money. What you want for dinner? Noodle again? Yeah, you like your big noodle. Don't worry about freckle American men like that. Go to college, get married, then work, bring home money. I bring home money from hotel tip. You see my shoe, only $10 at Macy. Hey, your period not come yet. Don't worry, we take care of it. Your daddy say he's so sad you not sleep in your room. Why you go out? Your brother visit work on his day off. He not even bring home money. My whole life, you never know who I am. I work too hard, but all my children hurt me. And your daddy send his family all the money I bring home. Each morning she suits up in a dry, cleaned, navy blue uniform. 
Her name stitched in baby blue. She clocks in a Times Square among a frenzy of accented workers polishing faucets and her English. She wears permanent gloves and dried cracked lines. The housekeeping cart screeches, reminds her of the train outside her housing development. A mere 411, she's mistaken for Chinese, freckled beside aging almond eyes, short perm and dark dye, teeth composed like a magazine smile, belly trembling from four children. You eat now, why you sing? The time for eat and the time for sing. Now, the time for eat. <laughs> True story. <laughs> Y'all don't even know. This is like direct quotations. <laughs> Our languages are broken. These new tongues still on loan are fractured in a language of pain. Natives hum of trespass among their borders in a swelling moan. These American shores experience waves of amassed culture. Every English word is a betrayal of our past. You want Chinese bun? I buy it. That's your favorite. Why you eat like that? That's not nice. Oh, now you eat like high cloud with knife and fork. You know your daddy, he bad to me. He not nice when he young. He leave me home with you two and the baby and then go spend the money, gamble a whole paycheck. I so scared. Your daddy give me $10. I lock you guy in the house. I tell Sodi, not open the door to nobody. Then I run in the supermarket, buy the food on sale, all the chip, all the cookie. Your poor brother always hungry. He the one I love the most. In Paul Putt time, I give him all my rice, but not good enough. Now I buy you guy any food you want. Make sure you marry. <laughs> Make sure you marry a man. Make sure you marry who you love. Make sure a man love you. Make sure you marry a man who you love who love you, sorry, more than you love him. Damn, girl, why you ain't stomping roaches? You look so light when you jump double dutch. Turn around, let me braid your good hair. Those pants you wearing are tight. You gonna see your boyfriend today. <laughs> Heard that new Mariah Carey? You sing it good, like a black girl. You see Lizette look in her mirror? Ain't no makeup in the world gonna make her look less ugly. Miss your period? My sister said drink hot Malta and you lose the baby. He called you an oriental bitch. Damn Bobby Brown wannabe with his gumby ass haircut. <laughs> his last name Bacon? I eat him for lunch. <laughs> that was his real last name though. <laughs> Octavius Bacon, you are famous now. Okay. We exchange chokeholds instead of rings. It takes two 40 ounces to confess your love only to sleep with your deafening snore. Commitment is making it through airport security with crystal meth rocks in your crotch. The only white I wear is spilled dust from your mirrors and money straws. Your legs dangle from a second story window laughing at tequila induced enemies. You think girls deserve rape. Attached names biologically wed to me, slut, whore, baby. Threats of your hetero language, I was gonna marry you. Through another's hands, the veil is removed from my face. Child, she says, this is what they look like. From the bamboo fine-toothed comb, she pulls out a lice knit, then smashes it between two thumbnails like beef under her incisors. Quietly, she continues through the black mop of her daughter's hair in the apartment where the landlord doesn't install bug screens. In summers, the children slept with windows open, awoke to mysterious insects flown in from the urban rock formation they mistakenly called a mountain. I compose you letters in the air among scattered saffron dust on this road. 
Darling pineapples with golden flesh call for attention in roadside display. Vendors in conical straw hats heckle motorists in face masks who reply with shrill retorts. Time slows down to the soft folds of a monk's crimson robe in traffic. The day departs in turmeric hues across the Phnom Penh sky. A two-stringed fiddle announces a resplendent wedding of silk and sashes. Poles of the bow resonate across my rib cage in continence to you. I am the longing in its timbre, the ache in the string's tension. <sighs> Sorry. First generation Cambodian American mother Facebook typo. <laughs> That's the title. <laughs> Good luck, homie. I was trying not to read titles because I'd rather go through like a, a big world, like a story. But this one's actually called Good Luck, Homie. You know, my life good. Now I know like I happy. I use the Skype, Facebook, and I not alone. I take the picture, put on the Facebook, and everybody like it. I not know how to read before, but now I good. How you write? Beautiful. I want to write when I see the picture my friend say, how are you? Look good, sister. That how you spell? Oh my God, I never know. <laughs> now I know. I learned so much from you. You see, honey, you my good luck. Oh, oh two and a half minutes. Okay. Cambodian script resembles slurped noodles in Phnom Penh immersed in orange curry, peppers of blood red and turmeric golden as my cousin's monastic robe. I wanted only noodle dinners for two weeks as a child. Mother sliced strips of beef like M dash as they stiffened in the heat of her broth. Some characters resemble the outline of my daughter's pinky, sometimes inverted, a loop beneath or above. Every morning I detangle the knots she creates with her dreams, draw a line to part her hair. Once combed, I braid her hair into scents, just as I unravel the curls of this script, trace family lines, pronounced on my hip, curved in my eyes, looped like my mother's sarong, coming undone. This is for my daughter. I see years of history before you, my Cambodian daughter. I named you in Sanskrit as the sun, a Hindu god. You contain the darkness of our genocide. You are the potential of our refugees to come back from near extinction. I see you, I see you, in a stone homage to gods and kings among the Bayon's tower of echoing faces. You are the danseuse Cambodian who wooed Rodin to that Paris dock immortalized in watercolor. You will be too much or not enough. They will mispronounce you, misspell you. Yogis will hear your name and think sun salutations. Remember those who bow to your light must not burn from your sun. And uh, I think I'm gonna close with this one. It's called, um, actually no, no, two more. Because they're mad short. This one's called Pulse and Two. You are my breath mark. I try to steady the metronome in my heart. Okay, last one. Don't let your heritage be past tense. Think of your great grandmother in woven silk, countless threads through her hands, weaving lines, intersecting her face and palms, her children who compose your motherland fabric. Songsters of Cambodia's golden age, blare from past decades in static singing across time with the rusty accordion. We have numerous words for eat, see, nyam, hope, chan, pisa, each bite is love. 
Ye asks if you are hungry because it took 30 years to say I love you like an American. You imagine a future not yet past of grandfather's garden in Georgia, untended in the southern red clay where fruit trees have taken root. Someday you will taste dragon fruit on par with his on the streets of Phnom Penh. Ta's face is bright when he sees you enjoy its flesh, studded with seeds. He says, I wish I could be here when the apple trees bloom. Thank you so much. Give it up for our readers. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. You were amazing. Please stick around, buy books. We have some wine in the back. You can meet the poets. I'm sure they'd be happy to sign their books for you as well. And thanks again. Thank you.